in a second. There we go. And uh, I'm gonna get our Facebook Live set up for our Remax Realtron Facebook page. So if you get kicked off of Zoom for whatever reason, we are on Facebook Live. If you wanna watch it again, you can watch it there. Gentlemen, welcome. Hello, thank you so much for being here. Uh, as I said, my name is Jeremy Kolarski. I'm Vice President of Agent Experience for Remax Realtron. I'm joined by Alex Polarski, who's the broker owner and co-founder of Remax Realtron. Alex has a wealth of real estate experience he's going to bring to us today. Uh, Alex got his real estate license in the early 70s. Was it 72 or 73? We always have this uh, argument. November 7th is uh, 50 years. I got my license. years in real estate. Yes, wow. yes. So 50 that's amazing, years. Alex. Uh, so you have a wealth of experience. You've been through the ups and the downs and you've ridden out storms and you've had amazing times uh, and you've had challenges in the business and that has brought you here today to give us a world of experience uh, that we are gonna rely on today to talk about the real estate market and to help people make great decisions about what they're going to do. Welcome, Alex. Thank you. And of course, uh, we're also- oh. Yep, I was gonna say, I think this is my sixth recession and fifth downturn. So uh, I've seen a lot of ups and downs in the market. So looking forward to uh, sharing my experiences with everyone. That is great. And we're also joined by, and by the way, the Facebook Live just happened. So we are live on Facebook. Uh, we are also joined by Remax Realtron COO, Cam Forbes. Cam joined Remax Realtron about eight years ago. Uh, he's also got a wealth of knowledge with over 30 years in the real estate business uh, as an executive with several different real estate companies and now Remax Realtron. Cam has a unique look at how things are in the market. And as a CA, he's got an expertise in the economy, in uh, understanding the numbers and analysis. So we have a wealth of knowledge behind us. Uh, I'm going to take them through some questions, talk about the market, and then of course we're going to get to the three mistakes to avoid, which we guys, we sat down, we talked about what those were. And the number one reason for doing this, by the way, this is our sixth one of these public forums. We did them starting in COVID because we wanted to get directly to the people and past all of the misinformation and uncertainty that people had. Uh, it's become a great vehicle to connect with our agents and our agents' clients. Um, so the purpose of today is to just help you navigate this particular segment of the market that we're going through now. Uh, so gentlemen, are we ready to get started? All set. Ready to roll. Good. <laughs> so, uh, Alex, I'm going to start with you. Uh, you know, as we said, there are lots of headlines. There's lots of different news out there. What is the truth about what's really happening in the real estate market right now? How are things going? There's no question the number of sales is down from last year, which was a record year in the history in the 80 plus year history of the Toronto Real Estate Board. Um, but sales are taking place. Uh, there has been um, um, a change in the market. Uh, there are a lot fewer sales happening, um, which is to be expected when things change. It's also to be expected after a record year. So every year can't be better than the preceding year. Right. So we're gonna see a, a bunch of changes. Uh, Cam, the number one change, of course, this has been all over the news uh, and, and real estate agents are, are excited to share it with their clients often. We wanna let our clients know, interest rates have dramatically changed. What's happening with that? Why are interest rates changing? Give us a, a you know, 30,000 foot view of the economy and what's happening with that and why interest rates are going up. For sure. Thanks so much, Jeremy, and uh, great to be here with everybody. Thanks so much for attending. The economy, of course, is uh, the macro economy driven by uh, interest rates. And so I know a lot of Canadians are not necessarily familiar with why interest rates are rising. So great question to ask. Really, the answer to that is inflation. So we, of course, are in a period of time where inflation is much higher than is desirable. The central banks of all countries in the world really are focused on making sure they get control of inflation. And the tool they have to do that is interest rates. So at the end of the day, the reason why interest rates are rising now is to tame inflation. 
You know, the good part about this is we've been here, we've done this before. You know, the the reality is it's a short-term type of thing. It's going to be good for us all in the long run. In the short run, you know, possibly some challenges and pain, but certainly some opportunities. And uh, that's a lot of what we want to talk to you about today is pitfalls and opportunities. But again, interest rates are going up because inflation needs to come under control. And that's uh, going to cause a slowing in the market that Alex has referred to. Right. So Alex, with that slowing in the market, um, what's happening with inventory? I know it's, it's a little bit counterintuitive what's happening right now. As we hear markets slowing, as we hear less buyers out there, interest rates increasing, is the market being flooded with listings? What's happening from when the buyers are looking at stuff? What's happening from that point of view? And actually, you gave me a chart that I'll put up while, while you're talking. Sure. So, you know, it, it's uh, the R word has been talked about probably for 20 years. It's coming, it's coming, it's coming. It's coming and, and the interest rates are uh, supposed to create a bit of a recession, the increase in rates, uh, to, to hold down inflation. Uh, which is critical because inflation hurts many people, including those on fixed incomes and so on. So it's really critical that the government controls it. Um, uh, yep, sorry, uh, let's see. So yeah, the number of sales is down, but what is different about uh, the market so far is in previous recessions or previous downturns, the number of listings have increased dramatically. Um, and this has not happened this time. Uh, last month being September, we had just over 5,000 homes sold and the listing inventory is only approximately 13,000. So uh, one out of three homes is, is basically selling, which is unusual. We have to keep an eye on it because it's possible that the full impact of, of the, the downturn hasn't occurred yet. But at this point in time, um, it's still very much a, a strong market uh, provided sellers uh, price their homes correctly. Yeah, you know, Alex, I just want to pick up on that. So uh, absolutely. And great question, Jeremy. There's There hasn't been a, a huge uh, increase in listings. The market is still pretty tight. Uh, you know, in some places, it is still a seller's market, right? Still multiple offers. You price your home quickly. There's uh, selling over the asking price, that sort of thing. It's really important to understand that. So yes, we do not have, you know, excess inventory in the market right now. And that's a good thing. And the, the other thing also, part of the issue is that last year was the best year ever. And it's, it's anything this year compared to last year is going to be uh, down. Um, I think the previous best year, Cam, if, if I can remember correctly, was approximately 105,000 homes sold. Uh, last year was about 123,000. So 20% more than the best year ever. But, but yes, it's a surprise and, and Cam and I are keeping a close eye on the inventory. But right now it's strange. The inventory is not increasing very dramatically. It's, it's still very low. Yeah, I think a lot of the headlines from this uh, latest market watch, which just came out yesterday, is saying that the number of sales uh, didn't increase in September over August. But as you can see, from the chart we put up, the inventory didn't really increase. Normally people put their houses up on the market starting the fall market and, and we've just had a slowdown. So it's really been slow, um, but there's underlying, as you said, Alex, underlying demand for housing. Uh, Cam, what's happening with rents? Uh, now that less people are buying property, I think there's still real demand because rents seem to be uh, hard to come by. What's happening with, with the rental market? Yeah, no, great question. And uh, so first off, 5,000 sales, there is you know still a significant amount of sales happening in the market. I think it's always important to remember that everyone requires a home to live in, right? And so if they're not buying, they're renting. And so what we're experiencing right now in the rental market is strong demand strong increases in rents 
And so it, it talks about one of the opportunities, frankly, that we'll get into, which is the investor opportunity in today's market, because rents are going up so much and there is such great demand for rental properties. There is still some great opportunities in the investment market to buy real estate to uh, and to obviously be a landlord and to rent to those tenants who need homes. Yeah, right. And part of the difference also, Jeremy, sorry to jump in, is the fact that in, in previous history, look, let's face it, we had a glut of properties, let's call it 20 years ago. And over the years, that glut of too many houses, which kept prices down and or reasonable, has slowly been eaten up by immigration, demand, uh, uh, children going up and going out. And so every year we've had less and less inventory and immigration continues. I mean, over the next uh, four years, we have 400,000 new Canadians coming into Canada, which means 160,000 approximately will come to the GTA. And the number, uh, so we used up our glut of homes over the last 20 odd years. And rather than increasing the number of homes being built to, to help supply, that supply is less. This year, it's going to be 22,000 new homes versus normally 50,000. So now all of a sudden, those rental rates have to go up or are going up because demand for rents and living space is so high. Yeah, yeah. that's a great that's a great slide. Is, yeah, I think, it, sorry, Alex, it was very strange. I just want to jump in and, and just explain what we've got here. It was so strange as things were slowing down and people were talking about trouble in the real estate market. This is June, 2022, uh, CMHC saying, hey, we have a massive shortage in homes available, both because as you mentioned, there's a lack of building, lack of permitting, uh, slowdowns because of COVID, but also just this long-term problem we have where the government's uh, supporting immigration. We've got lots of people coming. Canada is the place to be in the world when there's un in unstable times elsewhere. And here we have uh, CMHC saying, hey, guys, we're going to run out of houses. And, uh, yeah. yeah. Well, Jeremy, we have run out of houses. That's why rents are so exorbitant. And it will continue to be so because um, we're just not able to build more for various reasons. Let's not get into politics here. But the truth of it, a lot of it is held up by uh, red tape where it takes builders, you know, almost three years to get permits. Uh, right. But that's another story. Right. So there's no way to rapidly accelerate this. There's also there is uh, there is yeah. it, it somebody to cut through the red tape. It costs hundreds of thousands of dollars for a builder to to pay to get a permit, and it takes over thirty one months for somebody to approve it at City Hall. There's just too much red tape. Good point. And not to mention the fact that Toronto has sort of become an island, right? We always talked about Manhattan being an island and maybe it was different, but it, well, as you're going north, uh, everything below the moraine is sort of built up and you have to go up to Barrie or Ennisville uh, to get something on the other side of that island. So that's right. Awesome. Yeah, awesome. absolutely. Great. So uh, Cam, with this high rental environment, with this sort of slower price environment or lower sales environment, Give us some insight as to what the projection is over time. How long is this thing going to take to run out, to change, to evolve, to create a, a different interest rate environment after this one? For sure. No, great. Thanks, Jeremy. And so nobody has a crystal ball. I don't have a crystal ball. Nobody has a crystal ball. Uh, the bank of uh, the governor of the Bank of Canada doesn't have a crystal ball. But um, we have been here before in Canada. And usually these things, uh, you know, take about an 18 month sort of period. We're already well into it. Right. And so what I what I'd anticipate is toward the end of 2023, that rates will start to drop once again. And that'll be incredibly beneficial, obviously, to the market. But, you know, what is is important for us to 
focus in on, I think, is, you know, in that period of time up until the end of next year, you know, where are some of the opportunities? And, um, and, I, and I spoke about just briefly the investor opportunity because rents are so high and vacancy rates are so low. Um, there's another couple of neat opportunities. And again, the backdrop of this is that real estate's a long-term investment decision. As Alex has said, we've got 400,000 coming into Canada, 160 in GTA. We need 60,000 new units. We're only building 40 this year. We're only building 22. That's been happening for 10 or 15 years. We're about a million units short. And Alex and I this morning, we're just talking about population growth, right? So in the next 10 years, guys, think about this. We're going to have another 2 million people living in the GTA and they have to be housed, right? That's what everybody has to think about right now, because that's what's most important. And so the opportunities, you know, I, it's funny, a lot of people uh, in February, the buyers out there, right, they were competing multiple offers, tons of tons of uh, other people to compete with, tons of buyers there, you know, being unsuccessful many times, you know, prices going up and uh, you'd ask them, you know, would you like to have a market where you're competing against fewer buyers, where you've got a little bit more time for your decision and you got a little bit more choice. And of course, oh, absolutely, that's exactly what I want. And so that's what we have. And of course, people <laughs> being how we are, the psychology takes over. And there's so many people right now who can afford to buy, who are able to buy and who need to buy, but maybe on the sidelines incorrectly. And this is the first point where I also want to say to everybody that just like your investment portfolio, you need a professional realtor to help you make the best decisions in any market, but particularly this type of market where there's changes. Our Realtron agents are professionals. They're full-time realtors. They do more business than other realtors in the marketplace. You're dealing with experienced people who will guide you well. And uh, that's another, another thing that's really important. Right. Well, so Ken, there's, there's, sorry, Jeremy, there's one more factor, which uh, to, to the growth, and, and, and I think what makes me so bullish about the future of real estate, and, and I'm not saying 100 years, I'm saying, you know, two, three years down the road, uh, is, have you noticed how many young people there are around? And, you know, we can, well, not you, but me, I'm part of the, I'm the end of the baby boomers and we were high consumers and many of us. Um, but right now, the new bulge or the new group coming through is Gen Z. They started uh, being born, I guess, in 1995 is considered the Gen Z generation. There's 25% of them. And they're now in their early 20s. So what did we do when we were in our early 20s? We want to uh, have our own places. We want to get out of our parents' basements. Uh, this is the group that in the next 10 years are going to get married, buy houses, start their own families. And so on top of the immigration, we've got a huge 25% of our population are going to be major consumers. And, and I don't know about you guys, Jeremy, you're still <laughs> young, but I look around and, you know, the electricians, the plumbers, they're all in their 20s. You know, they're just young kids and yeah. they are the next major consumers and they're going to be consuming the way we all did. Alex, remember so, 10 years ago, all the talk about how millennials will never own houses. Yeah. And now they're living no. in the suburbs with three kids. I'm trying to figure out TikTok with the rest of Listen, us. Listen, I, I have to tell you, it, I got into the market in 1972, and in though, and there was a, a big jump uh, uh, in the 73 and 74. Prices went up from 29,000 to 39,000, and people are going, "How will kids ever afford houses? It's just isn't right. It isn't fair." And by the way, in those days, Jeremy, the interest rate was like six percent. Wow. We've just been spoiled over the last 20, uh, 20 years with these ultra low. Cam, I like what you, Cam has been saying for years. The money out there is free. I mean, getting a mortgage for 1.8% is unheard of. Yeah, you just back the truck up. They're shoveling it out. Yeah, they're shoveling. <laughs> I, when we came to Canada in 1965, I think uh, my father got an interest rate at 11%. I believe those were the numbers. I was younger then, but. It was what what we are getting today is not unreasonable prices. By the way, sorry to to reminisce, 
But when I got into real estate, I bought an amortization booklet. You had to, everything was, uh, we didn't have computers. And my amortization booklet started at 6%. So you never had a mortgage below 6%. So today's rates are, okay, they're high compared to the last 20 years, uh, but people bought houses and they will continue to buy houses because we all want our own places. Right, and the reality is with interest rates being higher in an inflation environment, everything costs a little more. And so that's what we're seeing with housing. So everything costs a little more, housing's gone up, whether you own it or you rent it, the reality is the cost's gone up. Uh, we have a, a saying around the office, you uh, date your interest rate and you marry your purchase price, meaning that whatever interest rate you get with the time you purchase will change. So sometimes it's a little higher, sometimes it's a low, little lower. At the end, but, but, your purchase price yeah. does. But the big difference today, Jeremy, is that there is no supply no supply is in the horizon, but the demand is huge and it will continue to be. Between Gen Z and 400,000 people a year coming to Canada, the demand we know is going to be huge. And there are no plans for more units, which basically means prices over time have to go up because it's supply and demand. Right, which brings me to this graph we put up here. Uh, Cam, this is the historic price growth. Uh, you always tell our agents about this and what's happening. Why don't you share with the public exactly what this means and, and how it will affect uh, purchasers? Yeah, for sure. So this graph, everybody, is both the historical <laughs> average price from the Toronto Real Estate Board, as you can see from uh, 1976. And it's a projection of prices from really last year's price, 2021, going forward uh, for a lot of years. And what we've always done is we've been very conservative. We want to make sure we guide our agents and our agents guide their consumers. You to make the best decisions. And so we, we do a projection. We just do a projection of 5% growth in prices and 3%, both very conservative, because I think you'll note in the middle of that graph, the actual average price increase over the period of time has been seven over 7%. 7 and so a five and three, very conservative. But the neat thing to look at, even under the 3% growth, is in 2056, you got an average price of $3 million. The average price now in the GTA is $1.1 $1 .1 million. So it's almost three times what it is now over that period of time. And so this graph is fantastic and really important for everybody because A, it indicates that real estate is a long-term investment. It is, it is not a speculative thing. It is not a day trading thing. It is not something you focus on the short-term about. You need to live somewhere. And in the GTA, the population is growing demand is growing, supply is not growing quickly enough, prices are going to go up. They just matter much how much they're going to go up. And you will be so happy as long as you're in the real estate market. And that's the key here to this chart. Correct. Right. And, and in a sense, that's what we're seeing today, Cam, I believe, which is people who could have qualified for a home for a million because interest rates have gone up um, are buying whatever they can qualify for because in February of this year, prices were an anomaly. They just a huge blimp uh, in, in demand. And a lot of people were forced out of the market, could no longer qualify. Yeah. Uh, now uh, they're finding properties and they're buying less than they could have six months ago but they want to get in the market, at least get uh, stabilize their prices. And they know that down the road, they're going to trade up, yeah. which again is sorry to, to keep going. But uh, your point is that there's some great opportunities in the market. Condominium prices have increased, whereas 905 detached prices have, have uh, 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 gone down. And a lot of people are taking that opportunity to get that white picket fence and have the house that they've always wanted. So it is a time of opportunity. Yeah. That, that was exactly what I was going to say next. Sorry, Cam, let me lead you no in. Problem. Yeah. Uh, we've, we've spoken about sort of what is the opportunity right now? And for a lot of people, it's that move up opportunity. Uh, tell us sort of why a down market is the best time to move up to a more expensive home. 
Yeah, thanks. Um, so the trade up opportunity right now is great and greater than it was in February. So let me explain. So let's just say that you were in a million dollar home in February, and you were looking to buy a $1.5 million home. So that's a $500,000 differential. If prices are now down 10% on both of those products, you're obviously down $150,000 on the 1.5 million and you're down $100,000 in the $1 million home. So you're actually $50,000 ahead. So that transaction now you're actually putting $50,000 more in your pocket than you would have before. And so that's really important to understand in this type of market, the trade up opportunities even better. And you know, the um, the one other thing, and I won't talk too long here, but I love Warren Buffett. I love going against the herd. And so the smart money, here's the smart money, guys. Over the next six to nine months, there's going to be headlines that are going to show, you know, scary headlines about prices being reduced, that sort of thing. As Alex said, we had a real peak that was abnormal in January, February. And so in January, February next year, this is when it's going to be peak. But over the next six to nine months, you're going to be seeing negative headlines, which is going to scare people. They're going to be on the sidelines. Most Canadians don't need to be on the sidelines. Smart money, you guys, you'll be purchasing in that period of time. Right. So just to say but that. The right. other thing, too, in terms of headlines the headlines generally compare this month compared to last year, the same month. By the time we, we get through a little bit of this, uh, let's say a year from now, uh, the sales are 5,000 a month. The newspapers are goes sales, you know, uh, same as last year or slightly up from last year. It, it's all just relative. It's not a real number. Right. Or, so or can, a real comparison. So we can guarantee if prices stay the same from now till February of next year, we can guarantee there'll be headlines saying prices are down 25, 30%. But of course, if you bought now, uh, prices would be the same. So that's, that's going to be the comparison. We know that that's a great point, Cam. And uh, like you said, if you're um, brave when people yeah. are fearful and fearful when people are brave, as Warren Buffett says, uh, you'll do great with this. And so this yeah. is the opportunity where with a professional and with the right advice, of course, um, that might be a Remax Realtron agent, speak to them. But uh, as a general rule, you wanna be in the market right now. And that's what we're gonna talk about. Absolutely. Um, but there, Jeremy, let me just jump in with one more thing, is the prices in um, uh, February, March of this year were an anomaly. They jumped for various reasons they jumped 28 percent which was ridiculous uh for one amount for one one or two months increase so so what's going to happen is if those people who had had to sell now would lose would lose money but anybody who bought last year is still even with the market today and if those people who bought in January, February at the height of the market, the same way as, as people who bought in the height of the market in the recession of 74, in the recession of 91, in the recession of 80, uh, you know, all these recessions. And, and they look back and go, oh, I wish I had bought more. And those people I can guarantee who, who bought in, in February, March of this year and, and overpaid compared to the rest of the market, in a couple of years, they're going to say, wow, I wish I had bought more. Because that's what happens is prices catch up because of demand, inflation, building costs, and everything else. So the, the, th the thing that we're, we're lucky with, or, or the reality is, the average buyer buys for five to 10 years. The average buyer doesn't buy a house saying this year and then next year, I'm going to sell it for a profit. Right, right, which is a perfect segue uh, into our three mistakes to avoid in the real estate market. Guys, the market update was good. I think it put us in a really good space. Um, so let's take a look at what we decided were the three things we see uh, that are kind of going wrong with people on their buying and selling uh, endeavors right now. So the first one, I'm going to just share this and put this up on the screen so everyone can see it. There are some visual learners. Uh, the first one mistake people make is waiting for the perfect moment. I think we kind of touched on that, Alex. You put that. Uh, there are buyers out there right now who want to buy and who need to buy 
and are saying, let me just wait another three months. Let me wait another six months. Uh, Kim, what's it going to look like when you miss the moment? And, and why is it so important to just get in um, without knowing when the exact bottom is? Yeah. And again, so real estate's a long-term decision and nobody can time the top or bottom of the market. And so what ends up happening is people follow others and they're always too late. And so what will happen if you stand on the sidelines right now for the next three months is you may be back in then with more buyers, greater competitors, more multiple offers, prices rising again. So you, you cannot predict that. You don't know when that's going to happen, except that is going to happen. You know, that is what's going to happen for sure. And so being on the sidelines for many buyers is the wrong decision right now. And uh, and you cannot, to this uh, point, you cannot time the market, just like you cannot in the stock market. You can't time it, but real estate's even more important because it's a long-term investment. It is not a short-term investment. Right. And Alex, for those who are stuck on the psychology of, I need to uh, wait, it feels like it's more expensive. It doesn't feel like the right time. Uh, how do you get over that hump? What's important to know? It, it's tough. Uh, the key is if you can afford to get in, get in. Um, as Cam said, once th th there is a, a herd mentality, and th that's what happened in, in February, March of this year, the herd basically said, oh, my God, oh, my God, prices are going up. I missed it in 2021. Uh, no matter what happens, I'm going to jump in the market. And they all jumped in the market and the prices went way out of line. Um, and, and so the same thing, there's a whole, the herd is waiting for the bottom. And, and you know what? It, it's like um, once you know that there's gold in a location, right? There's a gold rush. Everybody runs in. And then everybody's fighting over the best locations. And, and same thing here. Uh, once everybody realizes it's the bottom, you're now stuck with all the competition, with the multiple offers, with prices going up, crazy prices, right? Because of competition. Right. So right now, it, there's still a lot of competition. As Cam said earlier, homes are selling price, the homes that are priced right are selling quickly. And I think, Jeremy, your stat is 25% today are selling with multiple offers. Yeah, 25% so, of homes selling over asking price. Right. So it shows, it shows you that there's still a demand and people are waiting for the right product, which makes this market so unusual because mm -hmm. there isn't an oversupply of, of, of homes. Right. So when something good comes up, those who are ready, those who can qualify are jumping in. Right. And in my experience, working with buyers trying to time the market, they you just, can't. It, it just all of a sudden looks like, well, there's nothing available right now. And then all of a sudden the next month, one house comes out and well, someone was silly and overpaid for that. And then nothing comes out for another month. And then, oh, someone else overpaid. And all of a sudden you just missed the moment. And I think, yeah. uh, I, I think that's, that's really important that people get that point. Um, if your long-term plan makes sense for you now, get there uh, if you can do it. Look, there, there's no question the uh, uh, increase, uh, the rise in interest rates have impacted the the psychology of the buyers. So some are waiting for interest rates to come down. Some are waiting for prices to come down. They keep waiting and waiting, and nobody knows when it's going to change. But as soon as it changes, the newspapers go, hey, prices are up. Everybody jumps in and now you're competing with the herd. Exactly. It's, it happens over and over again. Right. So don't miss the market is number one. Uh, number two. Sorry, I don't think, sorry, uh, Jeremy, let me rephrase what you just said, which is you can't time the market if you can afford to get and and the most important thing is get into the market yes i know you wanted a detached house and all you can afford today is a nice condo or a semi get in the market that will protect you for future growth and price increases and then when the economics change you can then purchase the next level of home 
Well said. Right. So don't, as long as you can qualify, get into the market as soon as you can. Well said. So let's move on to mistake number two. And this is a funny counterintuitive one. When people are confident in the market, they will underprice their home. They'll price it lower and lower and lower. And all of a sudden, when there are not enough buyers out there, when the market's a little bit slow, they all of a sudden price their property too high. Cam, what is the good range? If your house is worth a million dollars today as an honest number, where should you price it? And what's yeah. the mistake you see people make? Yeah, you definitely have to be within 5% of the value of the home, right? If you're offside of that, your home's going to sit and then you're going to have a lot of other problems, right? The psychology of why is it sitting? Is there something wrong, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And also you may then be facing greater competition when you had your home sits, you got more listings that come on more attractively priced and you'll sit because of that. So this is incredibly important and your professional realtor, not all realtors are great at this, right? Your professional full-time realtor knows how to calculate what the market value is and the best marketing strategy for you to sell your home at the best price terms and conditions for your uh, family. Yeah. So uh, great, great point, this one. Alex, you know, uh, yeah, sorry, Jared, let me just build yeah, on what Cam, what Cam was saying. I've been tracking prices and sales prices since 1982. And when a home is priced over 5% of market value, it just doesn't sell because a professional agent knows what a house is worth. And you, Jeremy, when you sold, if you saw a house listed for a million two, that was only worth a million, you would say to your clients, they're crazy. The price is no good. Let's not even show it. Right. And you, you avoid uh, unreasonable sellers and unreasonable buyers. You know, we all have been approached by a buyer who says, listen, I'm looking for a deal. I can't, I want to buy a house for a million, but I want to get it for 700,000. And that's just not realistic. So you have to deal with a professional or your Remax Realtron professional, I have to say, even though it sounds self-serving, we have great agents who do a lot of business and are very knowledgeable. And, and so it's critical that your agent leads you to, to uh, price your home at a level that it will sell. Our agents don't want to list your house. Our agents want to sell your house. And there's a big difference between those two. So great. Yeah. And Alex, I think that point, uh, even more so buyers looking on realtor.ca or on our Real Max Realtron or Remax.net, wherever they're looking for properties, uh, they're filtering out the overpriced ones already. And the only thing that's going to get them going and then get them out to see something is something that appears to be well-priced. And I'm always amazed at how good buyers are at, at getting rid of those overpriced properties and not seeing them. So that's a great point. Let's move on to uh, point number three. And point number three, of course, um, you need to be well-represented. You need good advice. You need someone who sees the market. Point number three is choosing the wrong agent. And I think it happens too, too often. I think I have too, ma too many O's in that choosing. But <laughs> uh, too, too choosing the wrong agent. Uh, but I, it's so important right now uh, who your agent is, the variability between a great deal for yourself and a bad deal for yourself is the gap is getting bigger. Uh, Cam, what do people need to look for aside from the Remax Realtron logo, of course, what do people need to look for when they're hiring an, a realtor? Yeah, so the, the best realtors are focused on your needs and wants as the consumer. So the best realtor is going to come and they're going to ask you questions first off mm -hmm. to make sure they completely and absolutely understand what your needs are, what your family's needs are. A lot of realtors who are not great at what they do start pitching themselves, right? I've done this, I've done that, I've done the other thing. And so that's the first thing, right? If someone starts to talk to you about themselves before they ask you about you, that's a problem. <laughs> Number two, <laughs> then you got to get into, you know, what experience do they have? What advantages do they have in the marketplace? And not only Asian, but brokerages have advantages to attract more buyers, to get more showings, to sell the price for a, to sell the home for a better price with better terms, 
and with less stress for your family. So somebody who's got the strategic advantage to get more eyeballs, more people on your property, more offers. And yes, there is a lot more that they should be talking about than putting your home for sale on the multiple listing service, the MLS. A lot more than that. A lot more than that gets more buyers, will sell it for a higher price. And so focus in on what else they're going to do for you. Right. And, and well said, Cam. And, and Jeremy, part of that also is Remax is a worldwide uh, company. It's a recognized brand around the world. Um, we get 2 million hits a month on the website, which attracts a lot of buyers. So when, when a buyer from anywhere in the world is saying, oh, I, you know, I'm thinking of coming to Canada, or I am coming to Canada, I'm one of the lucky 400,000 coming to Canada and I have money and okay, so what does Remax have? What's the real estate market? And Remax is worldwide. And as Cam says, it attracts more buyers and the more buyers you have, the better chance you have of finding the right buyer who will buy your house at the right price, terms and conditions. So company and agent makes a huge difference. Really good point. I think that uh, wraps up our, our main part of it. Be, before you do, I know, Jeremy, we had discussed, I don't know if you got a slide on it. We had discussed the difference between agents. Um, do you have that slide? Yeah, I can of, pull it up while you go ahead and pull it up for a second because I know you have, I've seen yeah. it. And so this slide really highlights the difference why all agents are not the same and all companies are not the same. And just going from memory, let's see. Yep, you got the right one. Last year, the best year in the history of the real estate board, there were 123,000 and change listings, which means there were 123,000 buyers. And so that's 200 and roughly 50,000 transactions. 31% of real estate agents did zero sales. Now, by the way, these agents would say to you, I'm great, I'm honest, I'm trustworthy, I'll look after you, I'm an experienced salesperson, I'm a great negotiator, give me your business. 31% did zero sales, and 43% did less than six sales. So, you know, one of the most critical things in finding a successful professional is their being able to do the job on a continual basis to stay in practice. And if you think of professional sports, I mean, when you have a golfer who hasn't played for two weeks for an injury, uh, they're not as sharp as they were before they started playing. The basketball players, they practice every single day and they come out, Michael Jordan, the best, or LeBron, uh, if you think LeBron is, is the best. Uh, we can't an hour be that one today. Yeah, we can't. But an hour before the game starts, they come out and practice because to be sharp with your skills, you have to practice on an ongoing basis. And I have to say that somebody who sells less than six houses a year means they sell one house every two months. No matter what anybody believes, I can assure you they are out of practice. So, you know, if you look at it, that 74, your chances of finding the wrong agent, you have, you only have a 25% chance, one out of four agents are the people you should be dealing with. And, and I have to say that's a Remax Realtron agent. So a lot of, of uh, it's very critical, the agent you choose and the company you choose to be able to, as Cam pointed out, not just sell your house, but look after your needs. First, it's looking after the needs and then selling the house. And sometimes I know as an agent myself, I would say, Mr. and Mrs. Klein, you shouldn't be selling right now. In your position, you shouldn't be selling. And I would counsel against selling because our job is to help people make the right decision for their future, not to sell a house, not just to sell a house. Sorry to interrupt. No, great point. That's a great way to, to round it up. And I was just asked to put this slide up again so someone can take a look at it. Um, and by the way, while you're there, if you want to put questions into the Q&A, please go ahead and do so. If you want to put them into the chat, we'll look at them there. And if you have any questions and you're watching this live on Facebook and Remax Realtron Realty Inc. Facebook page, 
uh, we'll go ahead and monitor that as well for questions. Lots of ways to ask questions. Uh, I'll take a couple in just a couple minutes, but I just want to wrap things up here uh, and get a sense of uh, you know what we talked about and where we are. So let's just take a look at these three mistakes again. Um, Alex, number one, don't wait for the right moment. Uh, don't wait for the best time. Oh, I'm told the chat is disabled. Uh, so just go ahead and put them into the Q&A, please, if you have questions. Not sure how that happened, thank you. Uh, you can't time the bottom. You wanna just give us a one, one liner on that. What should people think? Um, it, it's, you, you, well, what, I just have to repeat what Cam and I have said before. If you can afford to get into the market, and, and of course, look, things have changed the way they did in February, and some people just got knocked out of the market because they couldn't afford to buy. Uh, to buy. Um, the most important thing is get into the market so you can at least have your foot in. And then as the market improves, at least you have um, a foothold. At least, and, and so over time, you can always upgrade, but at least get in the market because if the market goes up 10%, uh, your condominium that you bought will still go up and will keep pace to some level with, with uh, detached and semis and so on. So it's critical that if you can afford it, get in. Great, uh, that's great. Cam, on point number two, oops, sorry about this. Uh, on point number two, not listing too high, you mentioned within 5% of market value, what do sellers need to think about the moment before they decide to put their property on the market for a price? What's the last thing they should be thinking about? Yeah, well, they got to be thinking of what is the home worth, right? What is the home worth? And also, what are they going to buy? And this goes back to one of the opportunities, right? Everybody needs a home. So if you're selling, you're going to buy something else. You're going to live somewhere else. And look at the numbers. You're actually in a better position today than you were six months ago in that regard. So yeah. definitely got to price it properly, price it close to that market value. And secondly, think about the purchase transaction too. It's a two-stepper. It's not just the sale of the home. Great. And, and if I can just jump in there, Jeremy, what and the complaints, the complaints, the comments I hear from our agents is a seller will say, yeah, I know my house is worth 10% less. I don't care. I want to get 10% more. And then you can find me a house that's down 30%. And that's just not realistic. And the reality of it is, as Cam said, a great opportunity to upgrade because the, the more expensive homes increase faster and for more. And so be realistic and, and maybe have your agent uh, show you what you can get and don't get stuck on your price, but, get but, but look at the opportunity of upgrading for a lower amount. Great point. Good, and lastly, we talked about this again, so I will just wrap up on saying uh, that we appreciate uh, the value that your agent brings to you. Uh, choosing the wrong agent is a big mistake. Uh, we do so many education sessions, Cam, Alex, and myself for our agents to make sure that they are the most up-to-date, most well-researched, understanding agents in the business uh, so that they can serve you better. And that's really what we wanna do at Remax Realtron. So, we wanna thank once again, by the way, we're gonna open things up to questions. So if you have a question, post them in the Q and A or the chat, but we really wanna to stress to you um, that our mission is really to educate our agents, to make sure that we have the best agents in the business, both by being educated, understanding sales, knowing how to sell your property and also being given the tools they need to succeed and outperform the competition when it comes to buying and selling homes. Uh, we're really passionate about that. And if you speak to your Remax Realtron professional, they will show you um, the skills and the understanding of the market that they have. So please spend more time with your Realtron agent and that's gonna make a difference for your long-term real estate ownership. Uh, we have a couple minutes to answer some questions. I actually have some questions that were sent in uh, just before. So let me go ahead and read those while anyone else is putting any questions. Um, I had a question about uh, mortgage renewals. This was from Mike in uh, Scarborough. He says, 
his mortgage renewal is coming up. What should I do? Uh, he's the bank sent him a letter, and it's like he was at like two percent interest before, and now he's given uh, he was given four point nine five. Uh, what should he do? Should he take it? Uh, what, what should he do? Cam? Yeah, let me handle that one. Yeah, for sure. So guys, um, your Remax Realtron agent that invited you here today has partnerships with fantastic mortgage professionals to guide you in terms of your mortgage. It's definitely a mistake to just sign up for the renewal letter that comes from your financial institutions for your renewal, because you need to make sure you're getting value for money, you know, the best rate and terms for your family, just like purchasing a home. So contact your Realtron agent that is uh, invited you here today. They will connect you with their partner in business, their mortgage professional to make sure you get the best rate in terms on your renewal uh, at this time. And, and, and don't just blindly sell, uh, sign the renewal that your bank has sent you, right? A lot of times that, that uh, um, uh, renewal letter, um, if you, you can do better. Yeah, the so rates don't are just, much higher. Yeah, if you're yeah, afraid. yeah. The bank will not withdraw their offer if you ask for a better rate, if you ask for more ter longer term, or if you want to adjust your mortgage, they are not going to take away an offer and make you, uh, they're not going to abandon you. I think there's some yes. fear of that when people get the letter, they better just sign so that the bank doesn't find out about the car they bought or the investment property or there's something. They can't withdraw the offer. The, the key is you're getting a standard statement from a computer. Talk to a person. <laughs> Good. Uh, next question. I like this one. Uh, I don't have the name, sorry, of who sent this, but it's with stock market volatility, is now a good time to invest in real estate as opposed to the stock market? Anyone? Stock market volatility, Cam? Yeah, sure. I'll take this. Yeah, no, absolutely. So, um, and yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah. I, I mean, we're not investment advisors, you know, first off, but having said that real estate's a long-term uh, more stable asset than stocks. I know you're all probably sitting here right now, looking at your statements. The best advice is to don't look at those statements right now because stock should also be a long-term investment, but uh, yeah, real estate, the fundamentals for residential real estate in the GTA are incredibly strong, right? You don't have to understand what management's doing, whether the product's going to be obsolete, whether Amazon's going to come in and crush the the, the competitor, you know that people have to live somewhere, you know that 160,000 people more every single year are coming here, they need more homes that are being built. You know that the economy here and the attractiveness of Toronto on a world class stage is fantastic big job creation, big numbers. And so you cannot go wrong investing in real estate over the long term in the GTA, whereas a particular stock, <laughs> you can't say that. So so that's what I would say about, uh, you know, stocks versus real estate for sure. Yeah, and, and don't forget you are, um, in, in many cases, if you're buying an, first of all, if you're buying a residential home that you're enjoying, A, you're getting the enjoyment of it, Plus, it's ta it's tax free, and and in in that and in investment, you're controlling uh, perhaps seventy five percent more of the value, assuming you have a twenty five percent investment in the property. So you're actually getting uh, a, a price increase over a hundred percent of the value of the property. Right? Does, does that make sense? What makes sense? Yeah. Yeah, good. Um, and the last question that I have here is from Shireen in Richmond Hill. Uh, I hear now's a good time to trade up. What does that mean? I think we kind of covered that, Cam, but do you want to give us that, uh, you know, that trade up calculation one more time? Yeah. So there's the numbers, which is just simply this, that has prices have adjusted. If in the peak of the market, that sort of blip in February, you had, um, you know, you're looking to trade up from a million dollar to one and a half million dollar house. If prices have now changed downward by 10%, you're looking at 150,000 off the price of the uh, house you're going to buy. And you're looking at only a hundred thousand off the place you're going to sell You're $50,000 ahead. So uh, always remember that in this market, you're actually better off on that trade up opportunity.
But beyond the numbers, and one thing I didn't mention, Alex referred to this a little bit, um, because there's so much strength in the rental market and the condo market because it is a more affordable product, you know, prices have adjusted more in the 905, the white picket fence, right? So I'd also say, you know, if you are someone who's in a condo, who's run out of space or wants a backyard with a swing set and sandbox for your kids, now's a great time to look at that too. So you got the trade up thing going on, it'll actually be better beneficial to you. And you've got more choice, fewer buyers, fewer competitors to actually look at that type of trade as well. So that's another good one. Yeah, good. Well said. And uh, last question I have here uh, from Haji. He says, Cam, uh, what would you advise a client with 10% down? Uh, and this is for an end user uh, comfortable with the $750,000 mortgage. What should they do? Yeah. So if they can afford to buy with 10% down, great, do it, right? So be in the market, don't be out of the market because the last thing they want is to wait, you know, a year or two until they've got 15% down only to find the prices have gone up by 10 or 15% once again for them. So, so absolutely, just a bit of information for everybody. And some of you will know this, but if you have 20% down, you don't have to have mortgage insurance in Canada. So there's a slight saving if you can do that. So if people are able to do 20%, great, you know, 20%, but there's absolutely nothing wrong with purchasing with less if they can afford to do so. Great. Uh, Eve is a real estate investor. Uh, she has a few single family homes that they bought, rented, and rented, looking to build generational wealth. They bought their first flip in July. Now the prices have dropped and interest rates up. We're almost done with all the rentals. Not sure uh, we will sell for as much as we hoped. Should we still sell or keep and rent them? Uh, even if it might cost me $1,000 a month out of pocket. So that's a, that's a tough thing. I think when people see that money out of pocket, they want to uh, make a decision to uh, sell. They think it's a bad investment because they're losing money every month. Um, how does the calculus work on that, Ken? Yeah, you know, let me start that and now I can pick up too. But, um, you know, one thing people mistakenly do is they look at their mortgage payment and they say that's all cash out. And so it is all cash out. But a large percent of that is actually principal you're paying yourself. It's for savings is what it is. So that's the first thing. Really look at those numbers because it may be you're not actually out $1,000 a month. And maybe you're just saving, you know, an extra $1,000 a month or you're, you're a net zero. And yeah, you know, if, if you can afford to um, keep that property, you know, it doesn't make sense for you to. And again, look at it. You know, there's a great time to buy now too. So look at the you know, sell and buy. But if you keep it, real estate and rent and rents are going up, vacancy rates are very low. It's a good time to be a renter. Long term, you'll be so, so, so happy you've got that investment property. So definitely <laughs> don't just sell it, you know, uh, because you think if you can carry that, look at the numbers, it may be that you actually can carry that. You're going to have greater savings and generational wealth. What a fantastic way to help with your generational wealth for you, frankly, in your generation. And if you have kids for passing it along as well. And Alex, with your wealth of experience at holding property through bad markets, through good markets, what's the bottom line on this? The bottom line is I can tell you over 50 years, um, I should have bought more and I should never have sold. <laughs> <laughs> unfortunately, unfortunately, um, I had no money, so I had to sell in order to buy. But as much as possible, don't look at the short-term gains or the short-term losses. Look at a 10 or 20 or, or a forever uh, period of time. You know, we had, when COVID started, we had a number of investors um, uh, panic and they sold their condos uh, because all of a sudden they were afraid they couldn't get the rents and so on. And the rents now they would be making a fortune in rents right. so don't panic with the market have a strategy what is your strategy and for real estate it's a long-term strategy anybody who's you know it's like buying a, a day trading in the stock market you buy for a dollar you hope it goes up and it sells if it goes down you're in a lot of trouble we are not day traders we are real estate is long term and as cam pointed out the future for real estate because of demand lack of construction a new generation coming up is a long-term investment and and that is you know 
uh, uh, long-term investment, I'm saying at least five years and in a period of time, that's really not that long. Well said. And it might even be uh, three years or two years, but again, we don't want to time the market, but get in, have a long-term approach. Look, if you buy something uh, for a million dollars and yes, okay, for the next two years, you lose, um, you lose uh, $12,000, uh, quote unquote, lose. Uh, and then it, you sell it for a million two, you really haven't lost that much. <laughs> Great. Yeah. Right? It's not a loss. Look at it as an investment look at it as a long-term investment. And sometimes you have to lose a little bit in order to have that long-term investment. Great point. Okay, uh, Marina asks, do you feel that with, as, if inventory continues to be low, is there a chance prices may increase again uh, once buyers adjust to the new interest rates? Uh, I think that's a good point. I think there was a lot of shock at the beginning. Uh, buyers who were in the market in March, April, May, all of a sudden their perceived payment went way up on what they were gonna pay and those people exited the market. There's a new crop of buyers coming into the market now saying, hey, this is the interest rate. Um, so I know, you know we can't make very short-term predictions. What do you guys think? If, if interest rates moderate and stay about the same, uh, what's gonna happen? It's, it's hard to know because there are many, many factors in play. The key is meet with your Remax Realtron professional. What are your circumstances? You know, one of the wonderful things about being in a city like Toronto, the size of the city, is that there are always people who have to buy something bigger because of their family, or they've gotten a huge raise, or their business is doing well. Conversely, there are people who get laid off, and there are people who go bankrupt, and people who go divorces, and they have to sell. So there is always a buy and sell happening. The key is sit down with your agent, analyze the situation. And if you have to sell, then sell. And if you can afford to buy, buy. <laughs> Let's don't play the market. It's, it's, you know, it's, it's not what the prices will be. It's what is your circumstances? What do you need? And what will make your life better? It's not the market. It's you and your circumstances. And you really need a good agent who cares about you and your long-term happiness that can help you make those decisions. Great. Uh, Sam asks, uh, variable or fixed? Cam, what do you think? Yeah, well, you know, a great question. Um, so right now we're in what's called an inverse yield curve where you've actually got higher interest rates short term than long term. So if you go one year mortgage now, it's actually higher than a five year mortgage, which is that's the abnormal. That's short periods of time. It happens, you know, in this type of changing economy. So um, so the advice to me, uh, if you can deal with the risk of possibly higher payments over the next you know year or two, I'd go variable rate for sure because you will pay less interest over time with the variable rate than a fixed rate right now. So but having said that, for some people, People, stability is key. They'd rather lock in, you know, a 5% rate right now for five years. Nothing wrong with that either. 60 to 65% of Canadians choose a five-year fixed mortgage, by the way, just so you know. So it's neat when people talk about the change now in interest rates. You know, there's 65% of the people who do not have any impact by that interest rate now because they have a five-year locked in. They got two, one, two, three, four, five years left on something that they've got a two, two and a half percent rate on. But having said that right now, if someone can do variable, that's what I'd suggest they do if they can handle that um, variability. But if not, there's nothing wrong with locking into a five-year stable rate if that's the desire. Great. And lastly, uh, Anand lives in Ajax, has a townhouse, asks us if we have a first-time home buyer, they can do a $100,000 BTB. Uh, Anand, I'm sorry, I'm going to tee you up for that being a terrible way to sell your home. Alex, what should Anand do? He should talk to his Remax Realtron agent who can give them proper advice on, on how to, well, the question is, why are you selling? And once you sell, what are you going to do? And now let's find the best possible way to help you achieve your goals. It's not just about selling and taking back. It's really helping you with your future and your plans. So it's really important you sit down with an agent, like a Remax Royal Front agent, who can help you figure out what's best for you and your family in your future. 
and it's different for everybody. Right. And Cam, in terms of getting the property sold, if Ananda's committed to getting the property sold, why would uh, putting in a small group of people, uh, I have a property to sell, not be the best way to get the most money? Yeah, well, again, you want the greatest number of uh, buyers, potential buyers exposed to your property, which a professional real trade agent can do for you, you know, as, as opposed to having a small group of five or 10 folks who've got uh, first time buyers, or frankly, investor buyers, there's lots of people who'd be interested in buying a townhouse in Ajax right now, not just first time buyers. But anyhow, as opposed to just having a small audience, you want the biggest audience possible. And the Realtron agent will not only put it on the MLS, they'll put it on Remax.ca, they'll put it on RealtronHomes.com. Com. They'll put it on Global Remax Global. They'll uh, they'll put flyers in the neighbors' doors. They'll have a VIP agent open house. They'll have a public open house. They'll have an agent open house. They will get you so many more interested prospective buyers. They'll get you a better price in terms. And the vendor tape back. You know, if if you want an offer of vendor tape back, no problem. But you don't have to do that to sell a property uh, now in this market. It's not that type of market. But if you want to offer it and it's an investment for you, no problem. That just that's another attractive feature for somebody to buy your home. Great. Well, gentlemen, this was really educational and good. I'm sure everyone watching got a lot out of it. Thank you so much again to our Realtron professional agents uh, who invited their clients along with us to listen. Uh, to those Realtron agents listening in as well, thank you for being here. Thank you for being a part of it and for being uh, basically a big part of our success and, and how we get out to people as well. Uh, we appreciate you being here. There are going to be about 15 to 20,000 sales still this year, uh, which is a great opportunity to be one of those sellers or be one of those buyers. Uh, speak to your real estate professional, your Remax Realtron real estate professional about how you uh, can maximize the return on your investment or how you can get into the market in the best way possible. Alex, thank you very much for your wisdom. Cam, thanks so much for being here and for sharing with us what you know. Uh, it was a great afternoon. We appreciate everything and have a great rest of the day, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks so much, everybody. Bye.